Okay, so another AO2 essay here on virtue ethics, asking, answering the question, virtue ethics is a useful ethical system, you know, do you agree, how far can we agree, that kind of thing. Um, I have done a, a, a video specifically on, on the strengths and weaknesses of Foot's uh, virtue ethics. Now in the exam, you could get a, an essay which asks you about the strengths and weaknesses of virtue ethics generally, or you could get one that asks you about the strengths and weaknesses of Aristotle's theory, Maketai's theory, Foote's theory. I think the thing to consider there is that there is a lot of overlap between the strengths and weaknesses generally and the strengths and weaknesses of, of each of those theories independently. Um, and really the key is to make sure that whatever you say is tailored towards um, that particular question. So remember, using words from the question in your answer, as long as what you're saying clearly answers the question set, then it's okay. Um, what I would suggest that you do, though, is if it is about one of the particular theories, make sure you've at least got a couple of arguments which are specific to those theories, but then the other points that you could make could be the general ones which apply to any of the theories. So before we get into it, let's just go over our essay structure for AO2 essays. Um, so remember, for an AO2 essay, you don't need an introduction, um, but what absolutely you must, must include is a conclusion. Now, if you're running out of time in the exam, just stop, leave a space, and write a conclusion. It's absolutely essential. Um, and I always like to begin the conclusion with, in conclusion, the evidence would suggest that we should agree, we should disagree, we should agree to some extent, whatever, with the statement in the question. That's absolutely essential that you include that. So remember what we're looking for is an argument for, against, for, against, for, against, conclusion, or argument against, for, uh, against, for, uh, against, for, conclusion, wh which, whichever, and I'll come on to which way you round you would do that in a minute. Um, make sure that you link your arguments for and against together so that they counter each other. So you want argument, counter-argument, argument, counter-argument counter and so on. Just in terms of your planning, first of all, think about what are you going to conclude. So for this um, question, you know, am I going to conclude it's useful or am I going to conclude it's not useful? So first of all, think about that. Then start with the viewpoint that's opposite to yours and say that it's a weak point. So for example, if in this essay I'm going to say that it is a useful theory, I would start out by saying a weak argument to suggest it is not a useful theory. And the reason I would do that is because then I can then counter-argue saying, however, a much stronger counter-argument to that would be. So it's just better if you start off by giving the argu you know, the side of the argument you disagree with and saying that that's a weak argument or, or you know, only a few people would agree with that and then counter it by saying a much stronger argument you know, or most people would say that just gives you a much stronger line of argument a much, a much, stronger, um, much stronger essay you know, and, and just to, to follow that up make sure you start each paragraph with something like, you know, a strong argument or most people or, you know, very few people, a weak argument, some, you know, things like that to show that line of argument. And make sure you're using that elf heel structure which we've talked about on many occasions. Absolutely crucial is that you include an example for every paragraph and that you link each point back to the specific question. So this question is, is virtue ethics useful or not? So in each paragraph, you would need to use those words from the question saying, therefore, virtue ethics is useful because da 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 da, or therefore, virtue ethics is not useful because da 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 da, okay? So because I've uh, thought about it, and I'm going to conclude by saying that virtue ethics is useful, I'm gonna start off by saying that it is not useful, but 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 suggesting that it's a weak argument. So I would say something like, some people, or a weak argument, or few people would say virtue ethics is not useful because, see I've linked to the question, not useful, because it does not provide answers to ethical dilemmas. This is one of the key criticisms. So for example, because it is agent-centered rather than act-centered, and remember agent -cent being agent-centered it asks, um, if you are a good person, you will automatically do good things. That's, that's how you know somebody is good, 
rather than accented, which which says a good person is somebody who does good actions, um, because it's agent-centered rather than accented, um, it can't tell us whether or not, say, something like abortion or euthanasia is good or bad in certain situations. You know, it doesn't give you answers to ethical dilemmas. That's not what it's about. It's not about saying this is right, this is wrong. It's about saying what do I need to be like to become a good person who will automatically know what is good and bad. And so therefore, some people would say, for that reason, it's not useful. Uh, okay, so I've argued against, but I've said it's a weak argument. So now I'm going to counter that um, with the side of the argument that I'm actually going to conclude that I agree with. So I am going to say, in my conclusion, that virtue ethics is useful. And so I'm going to say, however, see, nice link to the previous paragraph. However, most people, showing that line of argument, most people would say, on the other hand, counter-argument, um, it is useful because... As it is agent-centred as opposed to act-centred, it focuses on um, character, people's character, and does not judge people on individual actions. So, for example, what if all my life I did bad actions? Uh, and so here, if we're you know, using utilitarianism, for example, things which make people un unhappy, like I assassinate people for money, that's my job. So all my life, that's what I do. So I do these actions all the time, um, which makes me a bad person, according to utilitarianism, because I'm making people unhappy. But then what happens if, is, if just before I die, I do something which makes lots of people happy, like I donate all of that money that I earn by killing people to charity. Does that now mean I'm a good person? See, that's the problem with something like utilitarianism, because, you know, that's how almost ridiculous it could be. You could do things all of your life which make people unhappy, and then all of a sudden you do something which outweighs that and makes lots of people happy, does that mean then you're a good person just because you did that one action? Now, virtue ethics wouldn't do that. It's not, you know, it, 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 it doesn't, you can't criticise virtue ethics for doing the same thing because what virtue ethics does is instead of judging you on individual actions, it kind of takes into account all of my actions, my whole life, and assesses me on my character, not on my actions. And so, you don't, it doesn't get caught up in that ridiculous situation where you might do one good thing but a hundred bad things, um, you know, and asking does that mean you're a good or a bad person. What it does is it takes, into, it takes into account the picture of your whole life. What do you do all of your life? What kind of person are you? What kind of virtues do you have? What kind of character do you have? And judges you based on that. So therefore, it is useful, linking to the question, as it takes into account the whole, the you know, the uh, the picture, the whole picture of somebody's life, and assesses them on that whole picture of your whole life, not just on individual actions. And so therefore, it's much more useful um, to determine if somebody's good or bad than, say, for example, utilitarianism or accented theories, which judges you on judge you on individual actions, because you can get into that ridiculous situation where you don't know if somebody's good or bad because they've done a hundred bad things but one really good thing, does that mean that they're good then? Doesn't You can't criticise virtue ethics for that same thing because it takes into account somebody's whole life, gives you a much more accurate, rounded picture, and that's why it's more useful. Okay, so back on to the argument um, that it isn't useful. So, however, a few people, again showing that line of argument that it's a weak argument, However, few people would say it's not useful as you may need to forego your own interests. You might need to give up your own interests. So even Foote admitted that as virtue ethics has such a focus on, on, what you're doing, on what you do benefiting society, that sometimes you need to give up your own interests for the interests of the society that you're in. So for example, if I win the lottery, I may like to keep all of that money for myself. However, according to the virtue of justice, if I'm going to be just... I should give at least some of that money to charity. Therefore, I'm foregoing my own interests of keeping all that money for the sake of, you know, being virtuous and, and giving money to charity or giving money, you know, to other people. And so, therefore, it's not a useful theory as it, as it does not benefit the individual and it makes you give up, you know, your own interests. And so some people would say, for that reason, it's not useful. However, a counter-argument to that, a much stronger argument which most people would say is that actually the focus on benefiting society makes virtue ethics very useful. So ethics is not about making an individual happy. That's not what it's about. Ethics is about making society a better place. That's why we have ethics. That's why we do ethics. That's why we think about it, act on 
you know, ethical principles, is to make society a better place. And if society is a better place, in the long run, that benefits all people. Um, so Foote suggests that with it, without virtues, society is an unpleasant place to live, and, and she talks about Russia under Stalin or Sicily um, under the Mafia, where, you know, people weren't virtuous, and that they're pretty unpleasant places to live. Um, and so what she says, you know, is that if people are just and honest, society works better, and it's a better place to live. So therefore, virtue ethics is useful, because it's focusing on making society a better place. So yes, you might have to forego your own interests, linking to the previous point. However, sometimes, if we do that, society is going to be a better place for everybody, and in the long run, that's going to mean that you're going to benefit more because society is a better place. And so therefore, its focus on making society a better place means that virtue ethics is actually useful rather than it being, you know, a reason to say it's not useful. Okay, so coming on to the final arguments then, um, a weak argument to suggest that virtue ethics is not useful is the fact that we must all agree with virtue ethicists what virtues are important. Now, there are other videos on Mr Gilbert's guide about... Um, human nature and virtue ethics and the key is that you know that virtue ethics relies on the idea that we all agree with what virtuous people are like and and what we should all aspire to be like so see those videos on virtue ethics and human nature for a bit more on that so for example Foote, McIntyre and Aristotle all suggest that honesty justice and courage are important but what if I don't agree with them what if I don't agree that um, a virtuous person is honest just and courageous what if I don't agree with them therefore their theory falls down you know, what if I don't think a virtuous person has those characteristics they're telling me to aspire to have? Their whole theory then falls down, and so therefore it's not useful if you don't agree with them. However, a much stronger counter-argument would be that it is useful because there are different lists of virtues and, you know, different virtue ethicists suggest that virtues are relative to time and society. So, yes, Foote, McIntyre and Aristotle have some virtues in their lists of virtues which overlap, but um, they also have different virtues. McIntyre and Aristotle stress them also that desirable virtues will depend on time and society. So they change depending on you know, what time period you're in or what your society needs. Um, so, for example, Aristotle identifies many virtues that aren't on Foote or McIntyre's list, as he's got 12 moral virtues. Um, you know, he also says that depending on the needs of your society, the virtues will change. And so therefore, virtue ethics is useful because, you know, in counter to the previous argument, it doesn't rely on us um, agreeing with certain virtues. Rather, it recognises that in different times, in different societies, the virtues will be different. And so it has that flexibility. And so it is useful because it isn't just relying on us agreeing with you know, a certain set of virtues, but instead it is saying, look, the principle is you've got to develop certain virtues to be a good person, but what those virtues are will be different depending on time and on your society. And so therefore it is useful because it, it has that flexibility within it. So in conclusion, the evidence would suggest, I like that sentence starter, um, that virtue ethics is a useful ethical system, linking to the specific question. Mainly, I'm using that word mainly there in my conclusion, because your conclusion should really focus on well, what's your main argument for either agreeing or disagreeing to the question. Um, mainly, because it does not base the morality of a person on their individual actions, but on their character, which is a much more accurate way of telling if somebody is good or bad. That's the main point for me, that it's an agent-centred theory as opposed to an at-centred theory, so it gives you a much more accurate, rounded picture of whether or not somebody is good or bad, which I think makes it a much more useful theory. So I've just focused on six points there, but there are obviously lots of other points that you could draw on to suggest whether or not it is a useful theory. So other arguments to suggest it's not a useful theory, um, you could say that virtue ethics, ethics is elitist, because according to Aristotle, only the, um, the philosopher will reach eudaimonia. Sorry, there's a typo there, which is not good there, which is not good. Um, that should say only the philosopher will reach eudaimonia. And so therefore, if only the philosopher reaches eudaimonia, if you're not a philosopher, which, let's face it, many people in society are not, because they've got other things to do with their time, apart from just reading and learning, then 
you know, you're not going to reach eudaimonia. So it's elitist. Um, following on from that, the suggestion that we all want to reach eudaimonia is unrealistic. You know, all virtue ethicists, well, certainly Foote and Aristotle suggest that the ultimate goal of what we're doing here is to reach eudaimonia. Well, that's a very unrealistic suggestion that we all want to reach eudaimonia. Maybe we want to do other things. Maybe we don't want to reach eudaimonia. Maybe we want to, I don't know, become really rich. Maybe that's what we do things for. Or maybe we want to be really famous, and that's why we do things. So, you know, not useful, because we, we may not all have that goal. We may not all agree with that goal. And also, the suggestion that, suggestion that we're all interested in our society reaching eudaimonia is unrealistic. Um, Especially, as, Arist- uh, as Makitai says, that we're living in a moral vacuum where we're all very individualistic and selfish. So th- the idea within virtue ethics that we all look out for and want to benefit our society with the things that we do, perhaps that's just unrealistic in today's society. And the suggestion that we you know, will return to that idea that what we do um, will benefit our society and that we want to benefit our society, perhaps that's just a bit too unrealistic these days. A couple of arguments, other arguments to, to, to suggest that virtue ethics is useful uh, or virtue ethicists give us clear guidance on how to become virtuous. You know, they give us lists of virtues, they tell us how to become virtuous. Certainly Aristotle goes into lots of detail about how you need phrenesis and the other intellectual virtues to develop the moral virtues and so on. And also another strength is that it has a different focus to teleological and deontological ethics um, so that... If there are issues with those theories, it gets rid of them. So uh, in a previous uh, video on is virtue ethics really different to um, teleological and deontological ethics, we talked about G.M. Anscombe and how she had an issue with teleological ethics in that as long as your um, actions result in a good outcome, it doesn't really matter why you do something or in fact what you actually do. She has an issue with that. And also with deontological ethics, who comes up with the rules, she had an issue with that. Virtue ethics has a different focus to them, and so gets rid of those problems. So lots of lots of arguments which you could say as to whether it's a good or a bad theory, a useful or not useful theory. The key though, please remember, what you must answer the question set. Don't talk about strengths and weaknesses if the question is asking if it's useful or not. Use those words, it is useful, it's not useful. Don't use the words strengths and weaknesses because that's not what the question is about. Use words from the question in your answer to make sure that your answer is specifically tailored to the question set.